Hello and welcome to Catching You Podcast. As you have noticed, there's a link in the show notes to send us a message. Lacey and I are taking questions to answer for future episodes. Send us your questions or simply drop us a message and let us know what you think of our show. Thank you and catch you guys on the other side. Take care. Welcome back everybody to Catching You. This is part two with Sam Bannister. Enjoy. I will have them highlight a different color, the name that we've heard before in a negative way. And then I'll try to ask three different families to get three different opinions on those people that are highlighted. And some of them I'm like, okay, I'm willing to take a chance on you and help educate your parents. And some I'm just like, this is a firm no. Your dad is obnoxious from the tryout stand. I can just tell by how he's standing and watching and how he's interacted with you before tryout if I want to get into that or not. I'm a travel ball coach, so I do on the side. I'm not trying to deal with pain in the ass parents. Welcome back, everybody, to Catching You. I am your co-host, Rusty Ham. I'm with my beautiful daughter, Lacey. With us, guest special guest, Sam Bannister. Welcome, Sam. Let's, let's pivot. This is a father-daughter mm-hmm. podcast, right? It's our journey from her when she was five years old until now and we've had our ups and downs we talked about it in the past where she started pitching and she's in and i talked about it and it was an aha moment for me as a father she's in the bat buster organization she's one of the top pitchers on one of these top teams and i was as a parent i was feeling the pressure so i was putting that pressure on her you need to perform you need to have these great bullpens so that when you perform, you're going to perform in front of Mark Campbell and Mike, and Mike Stitt, and you're going to look good in front of these colleges. So I was putting pressure on her. It was pressure on me as a father to put pressure on her. And then she came in the, with that road. She came from the kitchen, just started bawling her head. I was like, why are you acting this way? And I think you were 12, right? 11 or 12 years old. And so I backed off as a parent. I was more supportive. I asked her how she was feeling a lot more. Talk about your relationship, because you mentioned it, father, you didn't, your mom didn't want, maybe you didn't want you to play with him. Yeah. Growing up with your father, and how was that? So first, let me give you a lot of credit as a dad that your kid even felt comfortable enough to come to you and ask you that question. Like, why are you doing this? Because I was so terrified of my own father that I would have, I never, the only reason that I... I was able to do what I did was because my mom played that little bridge between the two of them and it they're now divorced 20 years not because of that but just like she was always that one person I could tell because I was so hard on me but yeah when I was growing up I was a pitcher my whole entire life until eighth grade every 9 a.m Saturday morning pitching lessons Starbucks run then pitching lesson and after about three years of just like dreading waking up every Saturday morning to go and probably get yelled at by my dad for not doing something right during the pitching lesson with another instructor who wasn't even him. I was like, yeah, this isn't fun for me. Every time I throw a bad pitch, you throw it super hard back at me or you're pissed at me in the ride home. And it's not enjoyable for me at all. And so I told my mom, I'm like, I even asked my pitching coach, and I think my dad was in the bathroom. I'm like, what are the chances of me being a D1 pitcher? And he was like, well, you got to work a lot harder than you do. I'm like, okay, so not very high then if I don't put any more than this one hour of pitching lesson in. And he was like, no, I'm like, okay, look that. I'm going to go, I'm going to stop pitching. And I asked my mom, I'm like, please, is there any way I can just become a hitter and a fielder? I don't want to do this pitching thing anymore. And she was like, yeah, of course. Don't let me, don't worry. I'll handle it. And I was like, okay, thank you. And then after two more years of playing on his team, uh, my mom was like, okay, if you and dad are going to not kill each other and you're going to have a relationship with him outside of after softball is done, I think we should get you on a more competitive team. Also, I think you're ready for that. So segued into that. But I, a lot of travel coach, uh, being a travel coach is me trying to educate the parents too. Like, guys, let me be that to your kids. Let me be the one that's telling them what to do stuff. And you guys just ask them what they want to eat when they get in the car. Like, I know you guys are investing a lot of money in this, but your kids are a different demeanor when they're traveling with just me and when they're traveling with you guys and the team. Like I can tell when they're relaxing, when they're not. And we live in South Florida. We've got a lot of 
Latin families, loud, just very animated. And it's not because they are mad at them. It's just that's how they are. And I have to tell them, like, chill, chill out. Like, I want you guys to have a relationship with your kids after this. And for the most part, a lot of them listen. And the ones that don't want to listen, they leave and they go and be the same way they are with their kid on another team. Yeah, so... You're coaching travel ball now. I'm sure you, right? Do you have conversations with these dads? Because it's not going to change. You're going to have dads or yeah, it leads me. I think all parents are going to hold their kids to a certain level, but that's why I like I vet my families first. I I do a lot of research on who they are as a family dynamic. If their parents' names come up in a lot of other conversations, it's normally a big red flag to me. But the families that I have, they are very, they're already educated on the process a little bit. Either they played themselves at a high level. I'm in South Florida. It's like the minor leagues of, ba of baseball. So a lot of these dads have already played. So they already know. But I've had a couple conversations since moving here. Of, Listen, your kid's, a, your kid's a catcher and her shoulders are at her ears every time she hears your voice in the stands, even if it's positive. Like, that's not helpful to her. And if it's noticeable to me, it's noticeable to everybody else. And at some point, your kid's not going to want to hear that anymore. And they're just going to quit altogether. And that's not good for anybody. And they seem pretty receptive. But like I said, some people listen, some people don't. It's not my, it's not my job to save everybody. But if I can help along the way, then I'm here. Hopefully this podcast will help somebody, right? Yeah. You know, but if it helps one person, then we're done. Seriously. Part of the reason why we did this podcast, Right Lace, is to help those fathers that are way too hard on their kids and, and they end up just, and it's not just softball, right? It happens and you see it in baseball, I say probably more than you see it in softball, but we've seen it over time that a lot of girls just quit because their dads are just controlled, too hard on them, and they don't get it. They, don't, they, don't, they haven't figured it out on all they want. Yeah. Because a few years ago, I started pitching lessons for a company in San Jose. And my my clients are maybe like 8 to 12 years old. I've had maybe one or two high schoolers, but that's it. Maybe even younger, like 6 or 7. And they're all just starting out pitching or continuing or being on a competitive team. And I've had a few where the kids do have talent and like with hard work and throughout the week, they can... They could go to a, a high, like a high, highly competitive school. And then whoever's catching is interfering yeah. with whatever I'm teaching or whatever I'm trying to say. And I mean, my pitcher gets really upset in the middle of the lesson and just shuts down and won't pitch as hard or won't respond to my question. But I'm like, which is just not helpful at all and then they come up to me and are like what does she have to do during the week what does she what does she have to work on like what's going on i'm like you 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 please <laughs> yeah i was like we just got to make sure that i'm able to teach her throughout the lesson without having so many interactions between you two and like you said they either take it or they don't i've had some people leave which is fine because they don't agree but yeah, it it was just it is what it is, but it those girls need to they need support no matter what, basically. And you know what's interesting is that I don't know when it changed or if it just became like more people like us that have come back like as women and like we've played the game and so there's more of us and now we're giving lessons and stuff where like back when I played, my dad was my cook. There was no female doing that. But like out of the younger ages, like you say, you have a lot of younger girls. I started out doing younger girls too. And it's, it's not even about the lessons. Like they need to go outside and learn these things stress-free. Go play wiffle ball. Go play pickle. Go play games without you having a coach telling you how to think and what to do and just being like so anxious all the time. I think we've really transitioned into organized sports so early in these girls' careers and parents want to be better than Susie and Sally down the street. So they're going to put them in pitching lessons. And it's like the lessons are helpful to teach your girls from a female perspective because they're going to they're going to take that in better. 
to learn the mechanics of it. It's not so that they become a professional athlete by the end of this week. That's not what the point of lessons is. And I think it's started off as a good thing and it's turned in and some people turn it into a bad thing by being just like so they want it so badly for their kids. And it's like girls until they're like 13 are like, what cheers are we doing? Who brought the snacks? And what kind of like what uniforms and game day hair are we wearing today? Like they need to listen to other people about the softball stuff, but it's not like the lessons are a tool that I think have been abused a little bit by the parents. And it sucks because I always say dads, but those are the ones that are like 99% of the problem. Like I've had one mom, they don't play for me anymore, but for the most part, it's always the dads. And I'm like, guys, you know that your relationship is the most important in her life as a male. So just think about that for when she's done playing and like what she's going to gravitate towards. And do you want her husband to be yelling at her like you're yelling at her? So keep in mind, it's more than just sports. So it sounds, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you, if, it, if it's apples to apples, if you have two girls that are similar in athletic ability, hitting, you would look at the parents and say, okay, I'm going to take this daughter. I'm going to take this player because the parents are cool. Yeah. I'm not, I'm going to cut this one because the parents are just out of control. Yeah. I've had some of the best players that I've seen, some of the most talented players come and I've had people like we have a list and I'll have my people like highlight the names that we've heard before. I will have them highlight a different color, the name that we've heard before in a negative way. And then I'll try to ask three different families to get three different opinions on those people that are highlighted. And some of them I'm like, okay, I'm willing to take a chance on you and help educate your parents. And some I'm just like, this is a firm no. Your dad is obnoxious in the tryout stand. I can just tell by how he's standing and watching and how he's interacted with you before tryout if I want to get into that or not. And I'm a travel ball coach. This is what I do on the side. I'm not trying to deal with pain in the ass parents outside, like for multiple hours outside of my practice because I also have three little kids and a husband and I don't want to deal with you if I don't have to. Plus, you can be the most talented kid and have parents, which is telling me, that it's going to be hard for me to do my job anyways, because if your parents don't align with how I'm doing things or the things that I'm requiring of you or, or disciplining you when you're not hustling out or running out a pop fly to the infield, like I can't possibly do my job if they're not doing their job at home. And so I'll take a less talented kid with parents that get it and invest my time into them because it's enjoyable for me when I'm with them than a parent where I'll leave the games and be like, oh my gosh. Like one more time, if I have to hear their voice one more time. And we've walked away from a lot of great fan or a lot of great players because I just, the parent, it's just not worth it for me. Do colleges do that too? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I told my mom when it came to recruiting, I'm like, don't let dad come to this game. Don't let him come or he comes, put him in the outfield because he was super intense and I did not want that to, I know they, they called my high school coach. They asked how I interacted with the reporters when I did that. Like, they talked to some of my teachers. I was suspended from high school my freshman year for doing something naughty. And I was asked about that. And it was, it's crazy how much they vet these families because Coach Andrea, that was a very prestigious program. It's a very prestigious program. You went there to play for Team USA, to play behind Olympians. And you had to align with the certain, he's Italian family, tradition, respect, morals, nothing good happens after 12 type mentality. And he was not taking a chance. Plus there was only 15 of us on a roster with three POs. Like that's not a big squad. So you get one bad apple and it messes everything up. So he was very into that. <laughs> so we talked about your having favorite parents, right? Parents that are just chill, they get it. What about your, I, I was a coach 30 years. I was a high school coach. I had my favorites and it wasn't because I loved, I liked their parents and maybe they we hung out at bars or something. <laughs> but, so people always, oh, you have your favorites. And I'm like, well, yeah, I have favorites because they work their ass off and they do what I ask them to do. Talk about that. Do you have favorites? Yeah. I mean, or it's funny because I'm a travel coach and a high school coach, which are so different, which I've never coached high school before. But I've managed to get all of my favorites on my travel team. 
So that's been very wonderful for me because they're like, what do you mean by favorites? I'm like, if I, if I, if you show up early, you tuck in your shirt, you put in your work in the off hours, you ask me what I need help with. You're the first in the drill. You're hustling. You're doing all these things. Those are things that code positive things that coaches like. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the best one on the team, but favorites in regards to you asked me, coach, do you need any help with the gear? Or you see me struggling with the gear and you just come and you take it from me. You go and you pick up all the balls without me having to ask you. Like you can, I always joke with the girls, like you can tell which one of your parents had give you chores and which ones don't because the kids that have chores and responsibilities are the kids that are, I don't have to ask 9,000 times to put up the bonnet before we warm up. It's just done automatically. I am very blessed with my 16s and 14s. And they always ask me, Coach Sam, am I your favorite? Am I your favorite? And I'm like, they're like my kids. I'm like, yeah, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. And you told her she was your favorite. I'm like, yeah, you're all my favorites. Now leave me alone. Yeah, high school is difficult, Mm -hmm. different, right? Because in Southern California, you have you you have Mercado, you have Batmaster, Crown Angels. We're all intermixing, and then all of a sudden, you're on separate teams and travel, and then all of a sudden, you go to high school, and you guys have to play together. So that was a different dynamic as well. Because um, we had a couple, like, Corona Angels on my team. In high school, I was on Athletics Mercado, and then I went back to Babbusters my senior year. But all those organizations have different ways of doing things. Corona Angels has Hell Week. I don't know a thing about Hell Week. We just... I felt like it was hell week all the time because of how many foul pulls I would have to do every single weekend. And I thought it was funny, like, oh, you guys just have one hell week and like the rest of the weekends, you guys are just not working hard. Like we work hard all the time. <laughs> totally. That, that totally. was like the bat buster mentality. Totally. Um, That's but, funny. Yeah. And then we would all like intermix in high school, but we had some drama obviously in high school but I think my senior year was our best cohesive team I would say and we did pretty well but yeah I percent Mercado <laughs> but we also had a high school coach he super chill he's like what do you guys want to do for practice today you want to do BP all right yeah he, like, got, yeah he knew that these top organizations the girls were coming from there he's like, I'm not gonna touch it I'm not gonna try to change anything Mario Tyson is going to say, he tells him one way how to do things. He tells him one thing. Mike's going to tell him one thing. So he's just like, you know what? You guys just, I'm just going to hit reps and, and get you yeah. guys. Some, you guys Play here. music, get reps, go home. Totally. Totally. Is that what you would do, Sam? Is it? This was my second year as a head coach. And I'm coaching at, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. It's called, his name was Marty Cooper. And he ran Gold Coast Hurricanes. And he, that was like the Bathbusters down here like he was the man he was the one playing in against tyson in the colorado sparkler championship like he was the dude so when he asked me to come help him at the high school i'm thinking it's gonna be like travel and we're the number one sports-based high school in the country so like our football team nationally ranked every year basketball everybody we have former professional athletes as head coaches for all of our sports like it's a private high school and then i got there and i'm like not necessarily like that it's still high school these girls still are in the pecking order of senior junior sophomore freshman and here you can play high school softball in eighth seventh and sixth grade if you're a private school so now you have seventh graders that are good enough to play varsity but they're still 13 years old playing with 18 year olds so even though they play for me on my team and they know how i like things and i expect them to be a leader they're not going to lead against a senior even though she might not play travel softball So it was definitely a learning experience for me, thinking like I had to take that travel ball mentality and manipulate it to work for the high school. But one thing I realized is I learned this very early in my coaching career. If you can plan a lot of team activities and team bonding, you're going to give yourself a a level up anyways, because if girls like each other, they always play better together. They're not like boys. We did a lot of team dinners and a lot of outside bonding and we pretty decent this year but it was definitely a learning experience and of course oh you're only playing your travel players i'm like my travel players are the top best three averages on the team and i don't know what you want to tell people like okay whatever let's let's pivot we're getting towards the end here i want to get your thoughts on because transferring back in your day was not a thing 
it was like you had to apply for hardship and you would have to probably sit out a year. Right? It was like forbidden almost to transfer. Uh, now yeah. it's just like, now it's just, it's gone crazy, especially recently entering yeah. the main portal. Uh, a couple of yeah. thoughts on a couple of things. Pac-12 leaving, right? You're, yeah, you're a big Pac-12 Arizona and now it's just dismantled, which I think a lot of West Coast people are just hearts just sank right yeah. so transfer portal and then the nil give me your thoughts on both on those three pack 12 mm-hmm. transfer portal and the nil so trans the transfer portal was not a thing i think the first person that i remember doing it was jen selling she's now she played at washington or she played at oregon went to washington had to sit out that year and that was a big deal because if you transfer that was like oh what are you doing you're not loyal you're not loyal but now I understand sometimes you get to a place and you maybe I was so fortunate to play for Coach Kendra. I know that not everybody's college experience is like that. And so I think to give people an opportunity to maybe be like, I've grown up a couple of years and this is maybe what I thought it was going to be. Or maybe you got new coaches and you're like, maybe this isn't what I want. I think it's, that's a great tool. But also, what do you expect these high caliber athletes to do when you're getting the SEC has these incredible NIL deals? And the pack doesn't have anything. They don't even have a freaking network. And so now you're like, as a female, I know what am I going to do? Go play Athletes Unlimited or maybe play for the pro league. I played professional softball. I made $500 a month. And two of those months, my checks bounced. So, you know, wasn't a whole lot of money being made there. And so now if there's an opportunity to go and make money like Nija, like before, like I'm very good friend um, with Taryn Mowat. She was one of my, she was my roommate. She's now at uh, Ole Miss or well, Mississippi State. And she was like, listen, I was, we were, we almost had Nigeria. We almost had her at Arizona. But at the end of the day, she's, she wants to get an education from Stanford. And how do you mess with that? Yeah, that's your degree. Now NIL's passed and it's, yes, to have a degree from Stanford is great. But if I can go make $200,000 a year and have that every year in my account, now I graduate and I have however much money I have in my account. And yeah, I can say I have my degree from Stanford, but you can't really blame these kids. Back when I played, we couldn't get it. We would have a meeting with the athletic department, all of the teams. If it's not available to the student population, it's not available to you. And we had to keep saying, we like chanted it three times. Remember, it was like this weird thing we did. Now you couldn't even get a free Chipotle from anybody. Now you can get paid in cars and all this stuff. And I'm like, but it's also changing the dynamics of teams, of coaches. As a college coach, like, how are you? These girls are making more money than you. Like, how do you feel about that? One, two, yes, they're good kids, but what if they don't want to listen to you? Like, what does that do to the team dynamic? What does it do to the team dynamic when all these girls have NIL deals and these other ones don't and they might be better than them? Is that going to create like a divide? I don't know if I had to deal with a pelagic or something, I'm giving everybody on my team that I like all the gear and maybe the ones that I don't like as much are probably not going to get anything. So what is that going to do to the dynamic of the team? So it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out these days, especially now that Florida just passed the NIL deal too. So we'll see for high school athletes. That's we'll right. see how that transitions into college. Yeah. You did a TikTok fan that. Yeah. You can't, you, you can't unring the bell. I mean, it doesn't sound like I'm going to be able to go back to any of what it yeah. used to be. As a female athlete, we don't have the professional, we don't have major league baseball. So I can see why some of these girls want to go and make money while they can. Because even athletes unlimited, you're really not getting paid that much. Not a livable wage, at least. Yeah, you go from hoping you're debt free playing softball to coming out in the black with lots of money. Totally. In the- totally. Totally. It's rising now. Like it's getting more popular for sure. And a lot more girls are going to play for the Ox League and like the WPF, but it's still not up to getting paid at at least what you need to pay rent like every single month. Like T- totally. Do you think some girls maybe would treat getting recruited almost like a junior college? That they- they are, are seeing, okay, I'm going to go to this college. I know I'm going to go to this college for a couple of years. And then if I do well, then I can just up and leave, go to the company that I actually want to go. I don't, 
I don't know. I don't know. I think that it's, I think that's how it is for boys right now, for sure. For baseball, especially. I don't know if it's seeped into softball quite yet. For the most part, girls are, girls like the idea of the family of going into a program like that, being your alma mater one day. Um, I, I haven't really seen that in the girls side of it, but I don't know. Could be like that eventually. Uh, all right. Well, you got, you have anything for us? I know we, we kind of touched on, oh, but what about your TikToks and the traveling? Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's get into that. Cause we, Lacey did all the, the traveling, right? She, when she was the bat buster, she would, she went to Florida. She went to Colorado. She went to Kansas City, Oklahoma. We did all the tournaments. It was pay to stay or stay to play. Or... Oh yeah. How old were you when you started doing that? Because you played SoCal softball. You guys get started way earlier than everybody else. Yeah, we, my second year, 10s, we were in the national championship in Tennessee. So we were going to Tennessee. We traveled to Las Vegas for the qualifiers. We went to Oregon for First year the 10. ASA national. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was when. There was a bunch of fires. All the games were getting canceled because of smoke with the fires and everything. I remember road tripping there, but yeah, I was nine, ten. Yeah, yeah. Like, national. I think for any competitive team, like having the goal of ending on a national is like kind of the idea. If you're a travel team, you want to compete there, so you're going to try to qualify for that. But what we're seeing now is like all of these national teams oh this is the national team of this program and this national team of this program and i'm like and my husband gets so irritated because he played professional baseball for 11 years and he trains like he one of his players is the shortstop for the 15 u usa team annabella abdullah and he's like the only national teams are from the countries okay they're not from here if you guys want to say that okay but like you don't need to go play on a national team from some team out of new jersey to go compete in California and then go to their eight tournaments in the summer. Like, how do you afford that? What's the point of even playing on a team like that? You're just, that's not real softball. But like now with the recruiting stuff, everybody thinks that they need to go to every single big tournament that by the way, is like $2,600 and a five day minimum stay. And it's uh, go to one or two of those. But you don't need to go to them every single weekend. It's also okay for your kids to just play a regular tournament for a trophy. You don't need to win $10,000 every weekend. Like, it's okay. And also, like, parents-wise, I'm looking at my husband. I'm like, what are we going to do when our boys are playing travel sports? Because how expensive it is. Like, I remember my mom, my, my senior year at least, like, she would team up with other moms and be like, hey. The girls are staying together on the team because it's paid for in their hotel rooms. Can I jump in with you and your room? Let's split a car. And I remember writing handwritten letters to different businesses. I'm from a small town. So the mom and pop grocery store and this one and like $25 here, $25 there just to afford playing. It's not mom and pops anymore. No one giving out small amounts of money to kids for travel sports. So like, how are these, how are they affording that? And That's the conversation I have at the beginning of the year with my families. Listen, we're going to go to this one qualifier. And if we don't qualify, we're not chasing that all around because we're not going to all these different states to try to do that and spend thousands and thousands of dollars. If we're supposed to be there, we'll qualify the first time. If not, then we'll just hit up these other tournaments. But yeah, the national teams and all of these things. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just gotten so money oriented. Unfortunately, yes, I'm a paid coach and people like, oh, you're in it for the money. No, I'm not in it for the money. If I was, I would not be a travel coach, but I also need to get compensated for the time I'm away from my job, which is private instructing. So if you want someone of my caliber and my husband and the people that we know to come and help, then you can just pay for our hotel rooms and our, we're renting a car tomorrow to save our team's four plane tickets. So all four of us coaches are driving to Tennessee, a 12 hour drive. I'm like, we're too nice for this. Shit. 12 hours. So, oh, man. Okay. But also, we have good families and good kids. And if we can give the game of softball back 24 more kids like ourselves, then that's what I feel like we've done it. We've done an okay job. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. We, well, we found Lace. I don't know if you remember. We were traveling in Florida and then we were playing like a SoCal team. 
So we're yeah. always a team. And it's like, why don't we just stay here? It'd be a team that we just played the weekend before in a friendly. And then totally. we're going to, and then we end up like playing them in the tournament. It's just like, that's not the point. We need to, we were trying to play other teams that are from different states and we ended up playing our own super. Yeah, I want to play other teams from different states, see how their defenses are, see how they do things differently, and see if we can beat everybody. There were some tournaments with Athletics Mercado where my parents wouldn't come. We would, we had to stay in a hotel room with three other girls. We weren't allowed to have, be in a hotel room with our parents. We were, I was, it was like, I was sharing a bed with my teammate and then I had two other teammates in the other bed. And it was like giving us the experience of what it was like to travel on a college team. Yep. Yeah. I'm grateful. I'm mm. grateful we get our own bed in college, but yeah. it was like traveling with your college team, which was, it was really fun. Yeah. And then, yeah, there's, there was times where we had, we had a teammate or two stay with us and then well, all these different avenues you could go, but. Yeah, just all these big tournaments costing so much money nowadays. Yeah, and there's so many different levels to the tournament too. Put in your resume and your application for this and that, and they're like vetting you and you're like trying to get in. And I'm like, I tried to get in the power pool last year and they're like, you don't have a resume. I'm like, because I moved from California to Florida, started a new team. So that team doesn't have any, any resume, but I have a resume. And they're like, sorry, not enough. I'm like, okay. Whatever. We're not going to do this. It's all playing a game. But back to your point about staying with your teammates, we do that. We start that this next fall. So once they get into their second year of 16, we try to do at least one or two tournaments where it's just the girls traveling with us to teach them how to set their alarms and get up on their own and eat breakfast and do all these things. And by the time that they're in 18, it's pretty much full travel of just Guys, we're renting vans. You're traveling with us. Your parents can come if they want. But also, parents, we're trying to save you guys some money. Here's the Game Changer video. Good luck. And we'll see you when we get back. Oh, Game Changer. I love it. Yeah. Uh, all right. We're, we're going to uh, stop in here. Uh, someone wanted to get a hold of you. I know your, your TikTok is blowing up. You're, you have some really good content. How could someone maybe reach out to you? Who, <laughs> Because you do private lessons. I don't know if you're accepting anybody now. Yeah. So basesloadedflorida.com is our website. And it has all the information where they can contact me. I also do a college exposure camp. I'm doing one this year in August 4th in Northern California. We got Texas, Utah, Texas A&M, FAU, UCF, St. Mary's, and Cal State East Bay. And they're all coming out. And we take 60 girls. They come to camp. And seven big ass colleges in one area for I think it's 400 bucks for a whole day like unheard of so we do things like that you can see that on basesloadedflorida.com and my phone number is on there scheduling is there and any other information you want to know about us is pretty much there all right very cool thank you for joining us yeah. they appreciate it thanks guys really good conversation we'll split this up into two parts so we'll have a part one part two Lace, you got anything you want to add? Huh? I'll be following you, Lace. Go chuck it this year. I will. Chuck it. I will. Good luck. We're going to, we're going to the Mary Nutter, I think, this year. So be fun. We'll be there. Okay. Go cool. kill it. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Love you. Catch everybody on the other side. Thank you, Sam, again. You're welcome. Later, guys. See you.